Lord. All right. Well, welcome everybody for joining us today. We're going to get started. My name is Joya Sangupta, and I'm the chair of the Project Management Community of Practice. And today we have the first of a three-part series on change management, or what we're calling campus readiness. We'll go into the terminology and definitions a little later. Um, but this is a topic that is very near and dear to our hearts as project managers and leaders. Everything we do in terms of projects comes because of a change that's initiated and it's important to the university. So we need to understand what that spectrum or continuum of change looks like and what our part is as project managers in that spectrum, how we can influence that change and make it successful. Right? So this is, again, the first um, part of this conversation. It's just the beginning, really. Um, Hewitt is starting an initiative on change management this year. It's one of their important top strategic goals for FY17. There's sort of a task force that's working on understanding how we do it today, because everybody has a different flavor of it across Harvard. And then putting together a framework of consistent guidelines, practices, as well as tools um, that we will bring to you in the third part of the series in the spring. And the second part, which we're going to do in February, will talk about how we work with the schools specifically to understand our stakeholders, the departments and schools that are recipients of change. How do we do a better job with that? So with that, let's get started. I wanted to introduce our panelists. We are fortunate to have three change management experts with us today. Um, we have Vicki Schubert here. Vicki is a senior organizational development consultant with Harvard Center for Workforce Development. Her clients include Campus Services Organization, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, as well as Hewitt. Vicki has been in the field of organizational learning and effectiveness for about 20 years, during which time she has seen and supported change management initiatives of every shape and size, and even some that have actually worked. <laughs> Those are her words, not mine. <laughs> Tiffany Shorter, we have at the end, is a senior change management lead in the Hewitt Project and Vendor Management Office. She's been with Harvard for a year and a half, developing change management standards and supporting projects within FSS, which is now part of Hewitt. Um, at least the IT portion is now part of Hewitt. Prior to Harvard, Tiffany was an organizational change manager at PwC. Patty Hatch in the center is the training and change management lead for the Hewitt Academic Technology Services Student Information Group. She recently celebrated her 20th anniversary at Harvard, so she's been here a long time. And she's developed training and change management programs in support of the library system, university-wide financial applications, and the MITA Harvard system. So she has a great <coughs> amount of experience locally here at Harvard. Okay. So, our agenda for today is we'll start out, I'll start us out looking at what is our universal struggle with change? Why is it that we struggle with change so much? And then we'll try to attempt defining that spectrum of change or the continuum of change that we discussed and what a project manager's sphere of influence is within that. Vicky will then zoom out on the organizational context for change and how we need to understand those forces that actually compel change, that initiate these projects, and how we move these recipients of change from awareness to adoption. And she'll bring up some case studies here at Harvard to help us understand those concepts. Tiffany's gonna talk about the eight-step change management model that most of you probably know about, made famous by HBS professor John <coughs> Cotter, and how we can adapt some of those practices into our work as project managers. And Patty's gonna talk about some sample tools that you can use to engage with your project stakeholders, how to ease that transition again during the project. There are many flavors of tools that you know we use here, and again, these are some samples that sort of a minimum toolkit that we would recommend that you look at. Um, as I mentioned, there's a larger body of work in progress, and we will share sort of a more consistent framework that we'd like to establish in the spring, okay? 
Please hold your questions till the end. I think we have note cards here. If you want to grab note cards, I don't know if they were handed out, but um, you can write down your questions as they come up, and then we'll have a Q and A at the end. Um, and you know, we hope to get to as many questions as we can. Okay. So as you came in and engaged in this travel activity we had for you, which is really to go down memory lane and think about what were some of your positive experiences with travel and what were some of your not so positive experiences. I'm sure you have great stories to share. I just wanted to hear some keywords or phrases that come to your mind when you think of the positive ones. Can you shout them out, I'll write them down. Interesting what? place. Interesting place. Okay. Let's start with the positives. What great else? food. Yeah, great great food. food. Adventure. Yep. Friendly, helpful people. Friendly people. Peaceful. Yep. Historic. Okay. History. What else? What makes a travel experience fantastic that you would want to go back and do it again? Different language or culture. Culture, okay. Yeah. It goes as planned. So that's that's the negative, right? No, Which is no, 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 no. Oh, doesn't, doesn't go as planned as possible. Something you were dreading, I dreaded good. Yeah, Oh, serendipity. That's a good word. Serendipity. Okay. Relaxing. Relaxing. Go out back here. Climate. Smooth logistics, like yeah, travel. Travel, yeah. Okay, so those are good ones. What about the not so great ones? Lost luggage. <laughs> <laughs> um, danger. Yeah. 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 Danger. Okay. Stolen car. <laughs> oh, well, there's well, a story there. Stolen car. Okay. Getting sick. Okay. Yeah. Delays. Yeah. Flight cancellation. Yeah. Grueling flights. Flight issues. Bad weather. Yeah. Bad weather. Bad weather. Bad weather. Bad weather. Pickpockets. Pickpockets. Yeah, you do sometimes run into those. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Bad mattresses. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. What else? Bad plumbing. <laughs> oh, that's really bad. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, so there's a good list of things, and these are sort of positives, right? So these are pluses, and the other ones are negatives of travel. So, you know, we hope these things don't happen when we get on a plane to go somewhere because we are looking for you know, that beautiful picture I had up there of a place that we want to get to where on the left, right, and on the right. Sir, your luggage is not missing. It's just gone to Dusseldorf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember instances like that. I'm sure all of you do. So anyway, to, to bring us back to why does this, happen. I mean, you know, we all had good and bad experiences, but how does it color sort of our feelings in the future of where we go, how we plan, and what we do? I mean, it really comes down to our biological um, phenomenon in our, in our brain. And um, so I want to share something from neuroscience that really struck a chord with me in understanding change management and why is it that we as human beings struggle with change? It's really a universal struggle. And so, you know, when we look at the positives, it's like, oh yes, all these, our brain lights up and says, oh, these are things that we like to go towards. And then when you have this long list of negatives that we're not sure of, we have no control over, we tend to perceive those as threats or negatives that we want to stay away from, right? And so there's really three parts of our brain. The frontal cortex that does all the cognitive processing is in the front, as you know. It's very small, actually. And it takes a lot of horsepower to engage. So if I ask you two plus two, your answer is? Four. four. A five plus five? 
27 times 27. Your response is like, don't do that to me. I need my coffee. It's too early. Because it takes, you know, more processing power in the front part of your brain to start engaging. So we spend 95% of our day uh, focused on habits, doing things that are by habit, that are automatic processing, things like two plus two that we don't have to worry about, like brushing our teeth and getting to work. Things that require a lot of effort or change and is different from our habits, we try to stay away from them. So that's a very natural biological phenomenon. Now, when you have negatives put in there, which is things like, I am not in control of this change. You're doing it to me. You know, I didn't bring it on. Or this is going to upend my life the way I'm used to doing things today, whether it's a new system or new processes. Then what happens is your brain starts to engage your limbic brain or your lizard brain, which only knows to, like, basic primordial things, fight or flight, right? So it goes into that mode of, oh, I don't really like you, I don't want this, it's not, it's gonna change my life, it's gonna make my life tougher, so I stay away from that. So as it is, this whole thing about implementing change is not easy because of biological reasons. So we, are, we already are starting with this framework in mind. So I think it's important for us to all realize that we need to create an environment with our change recipients where they're already on the positive side when we're starting to work on a project. So you have building good relationships with them, making sure that they understand and respect you, they trust you. So there's a model that a neuroscientist by the name of David Roth came up with. It's called the SCARF model of change, where SCARF is an acronym and it stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and then have for fairness or equity. These are things that from a neuroscience perspective are very important to get folks on that positive side. So it's just something for you to keep in mind. I'm not gonna go into the details. You can Google him. There's plenty of YouTube TEDx videos that you can watch to understand this a little bit better. But suffice to say that this is really a good foundation to lay with your clients, pay it forward, have lunch with them, you know, have a meeting and get to know them well before you're trying to bring about change that uh, when you don't have a relationship. It's much easier when you already have a good working relationship. Okay. All right. Now to talk about the cycle of change. So we look at change in an organization as a continuum. Change is necessary for us to evolve, to grow, to stay competitive. It's just how everybody does business. We have to keep upping how we're doing in all of the work we do. You know, systems die, they need to be replaced. Uh, forces from the outside, things that compel change could be things like a security threat to the university. So we have to double down and make sure that our systems are secure, like with Duo, that just was recently rolled out, right? So that's the first part, is something happens to initiate and compel that change. The next thing is we start a project or an initiative to actually implement that change, which is developing new processes, new policies, or solutions that are going to make that change effective. And then the organization, you know, as a project, usually there's a start and an end, right? And then we go away as project managers. Well, the organization that receives that change needs to do things to sustain that change. It could be a set of things. It could be from a business point of view, how are we gonna make sure this sticks? You know, what's the return on investment? What's the adoption look like for my users? For ITIL, you know, and in our IT world, when we operationalize a system, we have something called change management procedures that are ITIL guidelines in place. Recently, we are rolling out an initiative called an organizational impact initiative. It's new and you'll probably hear more about it, where we start to have those conversations early in a project. So campus readiness is a new term that Hewitt has just coined to look at what is a project manager's sphere of influence in this cycle. So it's that gray sort of red outline circle there. And we're talking about how you as project managers and leaders need to understand the forces that compel this change and make sure that your stakeholders understand it so they feel ownership. If I don't sign up with Duo, I'm really going to cause harm, not just to myself, but the university at large. 
and then you have a project that makes sure that you address all those things we talked about from an emotional perspective and help people to get from awareness to adoption. And then you just you don't just leave. You want to make sure that you have processes, policies, you know, good handshake in place with your business counterparts that you can actually make that change stick and it works, right? Any questions about that before we go into our detailed discussions? Alright, great. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Vicki. Thank you. So I'm going to use my time to plant a seed about um, the importance of perspective in successful change management. Um, Tiffany and Patty are going to, uh, in a few minutes, talk about um, a, a framework that you can use for planning your change management campaign and some tools and templates that are um, appropriate to the Harvard context. Um, but I, I wanted to start by um, sort of from my experience in the, in the Center for Change um, for uh, Workplace Development, the importance of, as, as Joya has just described it, the human dimension of change and what your role is in kind of being aware of that and moving people through it. So um, first of all, I want to, I want to, I'm calling it zooming out and zooming in because I think there are two things that you can do when you set out to um, uh, and launch a change management campaign. You want to take stock of, before you get to the point of planning your campaign or picking the tools and techniques you're going to use, you want to take stock of the perspective of the people who are the, the decision makers who are driving the change and also the perspective of the users who are going to be most impacted by the change. As, change, as um, project managers, your kind of primary sphere of awareness and focus is typically you know, in the realm of systems and the processes and procedures that needed to um, execute from this, you know, at, at the ground level. But when you zoom out to the 30 foot, 30,000 foot level, and you look at how the university organizes itself to deliver on its mission, you'll notice you'll see several levels at which change, organizational change, can occur and does occur. Change is happening all the time at Harvard. Um, and, and other organizations this size. But so at the most, out, you know, at the, at the largest um, scale, you will see changes that might be at the level of strategy and culture. And within that, maybe at a more operational level around funding models and structures, programmatic change, policy change. And then at the ground level, the work you're doing, the hands-on kind of uh, working surface of systems and process change. So I think that it's important, and I think that the most effective change managers even while they're in that primary perspective of systems and, and process change, are keenly aware of the strategy, per, the perspective, the strategy of the leaders who are driving the change. So Joya mentioned the duo, um, dual two-step uh, verification system. Think about the strategy that was driving that system's change. A threat from external to the university causes us to revisit our uh, strategy around um, information security and implement a man mandate, a policy of two-step identification in order to secure our kind of borders. Um, you know, very clear. But other, um, other forces that compel change are not necessarily as clear as that. That's a beauty because there's like very hard to dispute that one. Um, but thinking about, you know, other changes that might include more opportunity, you know, strategies that move on opportunity to improve the student and faculty experience, for example, or um, strategies to um, mitigate risk, or strategies to, um, uh, so ch legislative changes that might um, ch cause a change in, in your compliance regulations and that kind of thing. So lots of reasons why, but if you take the time, and what's your, what's your plan to, at the outset, take stock of where it is that your system change sits in terms of the overall organization's strategy. And then, you know, think about also intentionally zooming in to think about the specific impact that, that your change is going to have on the users who are, um, who are going to be asked to a, a, a change their behaviors and expectations. Um, so this is, you might recognize a graph like this. It says change management activities aim to move individuals from awareness to adoption. 
And this, um, this diagram is based on the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and it, it kind of describes what people experience as they move through the process of accepting new changes in their life. At the outset, they might be in denial. They hear about it, they're like, well, I'm just going to ignore it. Then they might resist if they don't want to deal with it. From there, they might move into exploration of it and then acceptance and commitment. So you can see it, that's what's happening as you're moving across time. But this other line, the dotted line, describes what might be happening at the level of productivity and morale as people move through that curve. So you can see that productivity and morale dip precipitously when you're, move, when you're in resistance and even exploration. You're trying to figure out what you're doing. Um, that each change management initiative that you're involved with will have different footprints around what it looks like from a strategic perspective and what it looks like at the individual level. That adoption curve is going to be deeper depending on what you might think of as the degree of difficulty that um, people are going to encounter in accepting this change. So going back to those two, I have two examples. One is the duo, uh, the duo um, system that we just described, where the organization's perspective is very clear, and this is what's on the website. <coughs> Hackers, including foreign nation state-sponsored entities, are attempting to access university systems with ever-increasing sophistication and frequency. So the user's perspective might be in resistance. I understand the reason, but it's a hassle. You might also encounter some thinking about, well, you know, do you have the right to make a change to my personal device, that kind of thing. But in the end, the, the, um, the driving force is so compelling that um, you're going to find that users are going to move into acceptance pretty quickly, I, but I need to take time to set it up. It becomes a technical issue at that point. So when you're thinking about how you calibrate your change management campaign, in a, in a case like Duo, your focus might be more on the technical implementation side than the creating the case for change side, where it's made pretty clear for you. Um, so the commitment to this change is greatly accelerated by the organization's ability to deny access, right? But think about an example like the performance management, e-performance that we put into place about five years ago. Um, what is the strategic imperative there? And what might be the resistance that you'd encounter at an individual level? So on the website, um, the, or the organization's perspective, the why for this um, program, e-performance, is written as the goal is to help employees at Harvard be even more successful and to engage managers in the success and growth of every employee. Well, that's a lot harder to get your head around um, and, and understand what it means, what it means to you, etc. Within that are very important strategic imperatives around creating a level playing field across units and schools so that people can uh, you know, effectively manage their career at Harvard, internal mobility. The university can do a better job of identifying, recruiting, and, and retaining top talent, develop leaders, et cetera. There's a lot in this, but it's not so easy to see from the perspective of the user. So as, as somebody who's responsible for project management and for change management, you need to be really grounded in the strategic imperative that you're representing with your change so that you can describe it to people so that you can bring them along. The user's perspective on this might be resistance. I don't understand the reason, and it's a hassle. When they move into exploration, once they start hearing about what the benefits of this could possibly, the benefits that this could create for me, okay, but I still, okay, I'm going to have to revisit the way I think about my relationship with my employer. You know, it really is a much more complex um, acceptance process. And then commitment, we'll see how it goes. So in fact, as much progress as we've made on the e-performance system and, and um, the change, the positive change that it has wrought, there's still a lot of resistance to it. And five years down the road, it's not fully adopted. You know, I think there's like 80% of people or maybe a little bit more. And I saw Isabel come in. I mean, she might know what the, what the acceptance rate is. But it, we're not 100% there yet. So every time you look at a system that you're being asked to implement, what, use, what techniques do you use to kind of get outside it, zoom out, think about it from the perspective of the strategic objectives that we're trying to implement, and then zoom in to understand what, you, what the degree of difficulty is for your user in accepting the change. And when you have those perspectives, you're going to have a better, you're going to you know, be better able 
to make the right choices around what your campaign needs to look like. Um, one of the things about zooming out, too, is understanding more comprehensively who your stakeholder group is. Um, because it's broader than just the little circle that had the system and, and processes in it, right? So you want to accommodate and incorporate all of your stakeholders into your plan for engaging and communicating the change and uh, you know training people how to use it. So, um, so that's my spiel on zooming out and zooming in in 10 minutes. How'd I do? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to hand off to Tiffany to talk about um, a, a way to map out the change management process. Yeah. So I am essentially going to go through the change, man a change management model that we're using and we're going to use to talk about change management and really try to illustrate for you guys some best practices that we've seen at Harvard. So how, have, how has this model come to life, um, for lack of better words? Um, so, Joya talked about it a little bit er earlier, but we're using the Cotter model. So, this is the Cotter Enhanced model. This model was originally introduced in one of John Cotter's books. He's um, an HBS professor here. He's been here for well over two decades um, in the Harvard Business School. He focuses in on leadership, and he also has his own consulting practice um, where a lot of this model was built off of his interaction with organizations and leaders across the country. Um, and he came up with this model in the leading, uh, the, um, leading change um, book. But this, this model is actually a little bit of an enhanced version, which was published in 2014, um, and it comes from the Accelerate um, Harvard Business Review article. And essentially, it's, it's the same model that you might have seen before, but the big difference is that big bubble in the middle, which is the big opportunity. It's really focusing change management in on the big opportunities that exist within, your cult, within our culture. Um, so here is some of the same things we've already talked about, whether we're trying to be innovative to provide new things for our students, or we're trying to do things that get us away from um, some of our security threats, like the dual um, example that that we've used already. Um, and one really thing that we want to point out is that this is just one way of illustrating change. It's not the, the end all of it all. It's just one way that we chose to illustrate change today. We could have just as easily used something like the ad car model. The principles around it is really all the same. So we just wanted to level set you guys on a change management model that we'll continue to use throughout the, um, the three presentations that are upcoming. So I'm really going to go into the model and just show you guys at every step, try to talk, to talk you guys through what every step is and what some of the things that we've done on projects here um, that have been successful that you might want to consider um, going forward. So the first step is really about um, creating a sense of urgency. And so that's going back to that opportunity. It's, it's identifying an opportunity that exists. Um, and that could be around many things. It's creating a catalyst for change. And so one of, some of the things I have up there is, the, is technology renewal. That's a, a big thing for us within Hewitt. We're doing a lot of technology projects, and that's how a lot of our projects start in terms of renewing technology or providing a new experience around some of our technology, whether we think of it in terms of the modernization of financial reporting. That's enhancing some of our um, technology that we have out there. When we do Oracle and PeopleSoft upgrades, um, that's really identifying an opportunity to enhance what we have. Um, and then we have some other projects that are that might come from like our, our top 40 goals or our ITCRB projects. Those are big opportunities that we've identified um, uh, within our, our, our realm of scope. Um, and it's really about using those opportunities to find out what's exciting for the people. What's the benefit for the users? What's the benefit for the people who will be consuming those things? Um, and so it, it really takes us to that ability to also examine, um, examine the market that exists and examine what's going to make us more competitive. Um, for example, um, creating a new... For example, um, creating our opportunity to improve our student experience, like the CIS project, that makes us more. That makes us a place where people want to come. Besides just being Harvard, you know, people want to come here. They they want to engage with us in a new way instead of having paper-based systems to uh, go through and enroll for courses. So it's a bit of a different experience, and it's something that we're providing. So it, it makes us. It gives us an advantage. Um, and then so the second step, and this is all a cyclical process, it, it's not to say you do one thing and then you forget about it and never come back to it. This is a cyclical, pro a cyclical process. 
you keep going through it. Um, the second thing is about building a guiding coalition. And where I see this as is a lot of our projects are successful because we identify those governance structures up front. And whether that's um, a steering committee on some of our projects, it can look many different ways. A steering committee on some of our projects and engagement council on others. It's the way in which you're using the, the people who have the power in the organization to lead your change effort. Um, it's really about uh, about how are we being, how are we using those people to be successful? Those people bring in more people. Those people are the ones that care for their audiences and bring them along that curve of adoption to understand. I mean, sorry, from awareness to understanding to adoption. Um, and that's that's really the key here is about building that coalition, building that group of people who will be able to do that. And I think the key thing to point out is it is about the people who have the power. You have to use the people in the organization that other people look up to or other people will listen to or other people will take guidance from. Um, and then uh, another key thing to note here is this also gives you the ability to assess your key stakeholders. So in identifying who are those people of power, this is where you have the ability to do your stakeholder analysis. And Patty will talk about it a little bit more in the in her part of the presentation. But that's a really key portion um, of this step is identifying key <coughs> stakeholders and understanding who has the power. Um, the third step is about forming a strategic vision. And this is really about um, shaping your vision so that the, the greater population understands what that is. It is about building an elevator speech. Um, it's about having a goal with initiatives up under it so you know where you're going and what you're doing to get there. And it's not that that goal or, those, um, or that vision is stagnant. It's something that changes because the project changes over the life of projects change just over the life of a project. So again, it's something that we come back to and we revisit um, often throughout the project. But the, the point here is that it's something that gets us to be able to wrap people in, to be able to wrap our end users in so that they understand what we're seeking to do and how it benefits them. It gets to the what's in it for me for your end users. And then the last thing on this slide is about enlisting a volunteer army. And how I see this here is really about change agents. So in addition to that governance where a lot of time we have change agents within our projects who are really the people who are vocal and the people who want to represent the project. Um, so this is about using those individuals um, as leverage for your project, whether it's actually creating a change agent network uh, which is uh, more formal or it's about um, informally using those groups of people to deliver change. Um, and uh, on one of our projects now, we're actually instituting um, a super user network where the super users are those people who come in and learn the, learn the tool and they, come, they become really familiar with the tool and then they become that go-to person in the organization for, you know, once the system has gone live and then once it's in a, um, an operational state, they are that go-to person that knows everything about everything about that system or that part of the system. Um, and then I'm going to move forward to the last four steps in the model. Um, and so the fifth step is about removing barriers. And one key way for us that we, that I think is one of the best ways to remove barriers within the project is through communication. We have the ability to remove barriers by being more transparent with how we're communicating. Uh, what we're communicating, when we're communicating. So the big thing here for me is about being able to identify how we communicate and doing, again, Patty will talk about this in her session with um, the communication strategy and the communication plan. This is the ability to say what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it, and being steadfast in those communications. Um, but also being able to tailor the message. That's one key thing that really works at Harvard. Because sometimes we do, a lot of times we do pilot programs where we um, implement something and then we keep rolling it out and rolling it out. And the important thing is that we tailor our message to those groups. The message to the pilot audience might be different to those who don't come on until a year or two later. But the key thing is to make sure that they understand what's going on through the full process so that people aren't in the dark as you go through the change process. So it's really about communicating often and early, as well as identifying those people that are actively resisting change. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that in the next one, where we're um, generating short-term wins. Uh, a good thing here is that 
a good thing at Harvard is that we're doing a lot more agile projects. So we have the ability to generate a lot more short-term wins and, sh and be really visible to our end users instead of having that big bang approach um, that might have happened with waterfall projects. Um, so one of the key things that we've done on projects in the past are, you know, besides delivering smaller portions of the projects, showing demonstrations to your end users to get their feedback or to, to let them see where you're going and where things are. That really helps them to, um, again, be your change champions, to understand what's going on. It helps the people who are resisting your change to come along the curve with you. It helps them to, to see, it, as much as it helps those who are um, eager and want it, it helps those who are a little bit more reluctant as well. Um, and then so step seven is really about sustaining acceleration. And so what does that mean? That really means that we're um, really thinking about changes to the system, the structure, the process, as we're, it's really as we're starting to get into that adoption and sustainability phase. So it's about what, what, are we, what are we doing and how are we using what we've done to become more effective. So if you think about um, once we implement and then some post-implementation things that we do where we're reaching out to our end users to get feedback to see you know, how they're using the system, what's different, um, if we can do anything around training to make sure that they're using the system in the right way. It's really about making sure that those processes and procedures that we're putting into place with the implementations are working, um, are the things that we need to do. Um, and the last one is really about instituting change. So it's about when that change becomes the new norm, for lack of better words. Um, it's about decommissioning the old systems and really being relying on the new systems to be the, the way that we're moving forward. Um, it's about day-to-day -day activities that become the old activities that go away and the new activities become your day-to-day -day activities. So it's about moving into more of an operational st stage, if you will. Um, so I, I kind of went over that in a really high level in terms of the eight key steps and, and how we've seen it morph into um, a lot of our projects. And I, I think that the key thing here is that we do do a lot of great things on um, a lot of our projects. We do a lot of great change management. We have opportunities to um, do better as always, and we have opportunities to leverage things from each other. And Patty's going to share a little bit about that and some of the tools that we've been using on projects and some of the things that we've seen that have been beneficial. Um, but I, I think the key thing here is that a lot of our projects have been successful because of change management things that we've done. So I'll turn it over to Patty and she's going to talk about some of the tools that we have. And I am actually going to stand for this because there's a couple of tools I actually want to show you and I, that requires me to click um, on, on some links here. So um, hi everyone. Nice to see everybody here. Thank you for coming. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some tools that I've used in some of my projects and that others here have used in other projects to help with change management initiatives. And these tools are not uh, set in stone. Um, they're actually in the process of evolving, and we're going to be working to develop some tools with the hope of being able to deliver you a toolkit by the end of this um, free uh, meeting cycle that you can use so we can have consistent messaging across um, the change management uh, perspective and making sure that we're all kind of on the same page when it comes to campus readiness. So um, we've had some folks uh, in the past, the folks who have worked for financial system services, they are now of course part of um, administrative technology uh, services in Hewitt. Uh, they had formed a community of practice, and one of the things that they did look at was uh, change management, and they gathered a series of templates, and uh, we, they've had people contribute to those various tool sets, and again, what we're going to be doing is working um, throughout this uh, fiscal year to try to come up with some real recommended tools for you to be able to use. And, but I want to kind of focus in on uh, three main tools that I use in some of my projects, and again, others have used um, here as well. The toolkit, um, we will be touching on all of these various areas 
um, including uh, not only the communications tools, the training tools, but the post-implementation -implement tools. When we go into oper operationalize our systems, that's really, really important. Um, so how do we sustain the change that we've made and make it the norm for day-to-day -day business? So I'm going to talk about a stakeholder analysis, I'm going to talk about communication tools, and I'm going to talk about um, a training uh, strategy uh, template. These are kind of foundational pieces um, to successful campus readiness projects, where you analyze the folks who are directly involved, those who will be your business owners, those who will be your project implementers, those that will be your users, and making sure that there is clear, consistent messaging from these groups um, across the spate of the project. One of the things I really want to emphasize about all of these tools is the fact that these are living documents. They continue to move throughout the project. They do, uh, it's not just one and done, I fill in this little template and I'm, I'm ready to go and I'm all set. These will evolve as you discover more things about your system implementation, about business process changes, all of these things do matter and sometimes you have to realign because of delays, because of unanticipated needs, things that were not brought out in stories or in requirements, however you go about your project management for the particular project, and also um, sometimes there is a disconnect between what some business owners believe the way things are, and then when you talk to a user, they say, oh no, I don't do that because of this. And it might be something very specific to their department. So you may not be aware of that until you start talking to people. And that is really, really important. So. Um, the stakeholder analysis template will include things such as what is the risk that we have with this particular user base? What are the risks that we have to take into account? These are the regular project management risks that we all take into account with all of our projects all the time. But at the same time, we also want to look at how that's going to impact them in terms of their day-to-day -day work. Many of our systems are administrative systems they are not the type of systems that people work on all day long. They work on that system and they do other things in their job. So when we're going back to the Carter model and when we want to create that sense of urgency that people talk about, um, that's really important. And the sense of urgency is something that Carter has written an entire book on just because that's how important he feels this is. A sense of urgency is not running around with your chicken, like a chicken with your head cut off, okay? A sense of urgency is what do we de need to do to move now to win? And it may not be winning the project, winning the battle, winning the war. It may be winning the moment. So when you're thinking about your stakeholders and you're analyzing those risks, those are the things you want to take into account. In addition to that, you also want to see where they are in terms of their commitment level to the project. How invested are they to want to make this change? Where do they see the benefits? Where do they, do they see the challenges? What are they worried about? What are they hopeful about? What can we do to then take that information to help inform us of how it is we're going to be able to proceed with a communication strategy and with a training strategy for the implementation of our project. So the stakeholder analysis is that living document that it's going to talk about all of those various things and it is a living document that will evolve over time. And what you're hoping to see is that level of commitment move up as you are framing not only the project deliverable, but how you're going to communicate what that change is going to mean and how users are going to be assured that through training or other mechanisms, you are going to be able to 
uh, enable them to perform the tasks that they are using either a previous system for or they're going completely by paper. When we uh, implemented the student information system for the first time last year, the registrar of the Divinity School told me the story that every September she would stand before her group of new graduate students and she would hold up a paper card and say, this is what you are going to use to register for your classes. And they would all look at her and say, what? I'm sorry. I just came from a college where I would type things into my computer and that would register me for classes. I have to now walk around and fill out this piece of paper and then get it to you. And if something's not right, I may have to go back and do it again. I'm, I got accepted to Harvard, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not down the street, right? I'm not in the wrong building. No, that's actually true. And so to be able to stand before them last year and say, here is the system that you will use to be able to register for your classes, um, to be able to ask instructors for consent for those classes that require it, and to be able to see your calendar downloaded onto your phone so that you have it, that was a phenomenal change. The students loved it. It was very well received in both the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the Divinity School by the students. The faculty, by and large, were very positive about the system. We were told by some faculty members, I had my most productive advising conversations that I've ever had. And this was from a faculty member who spent the summer basically writing into us and telling us, no, this search is not going to work. No, you have to do this. No, you have to make this change. Okay? But through our change management efforts, he was able to come on board. The group that really had the hardest time with this system was our staff. And that is because they have been doing it by paper for the last 30 years, and they knew how it worked. They could anticipate the students' questions before they even walked into their department. They knew exactly what to tell them or who to call if they couldn't know, if they didn't know the answer. But now they saw this system and they had no idea what students were going to do, what buttons they were going to press, uh, where things were going to be, how lotteries were going to work, how all these other things were going to work. So most of our efforts had to be spent working with this group to help move them towards understanding um, the benefits to them in terms of less time that they would have to worry about uh, being there for the, that the day the cards were due until 5, 6 o'clock at night to make sure that all of their students had registered for the upcoming semester. And we have been making the progress towards that. Having a stakeholder analysis where we could go out and talk to people and listening to them was extremely important. The communication strategy uh, template that we had um, was very uh, pronounced and very detailed. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to answer questions such as what um, messages do we want to convey, what are the key messages and to the key groups that we need to convey, what is their, again, their commitment, and I'll show you an example um, of a uh, commitment curve. I can move this forward. It doesn't seem to want to move. Sorry about that. Ah, there we go. Okay. Ah, this arrow. All right. Um, so this has an, um, a curve that takes us from awareness to commitment. What are the key messages that we have to do to get that information out there? Um, what is the frequency of those messages? Or as we like to use with agile terminology, what is the cadence of those messages going to be? And most importantly, who's signing the messages? Sending a message out from myself to um, a group of departments may not have any emphasis at all. If the signatory is the registrar, they're going to pay attention. So who is going to sign these messages? Who is going to pay attention to it? That's very important. And that's why your stakeholders need to be an active part of what it is you're trying to do. Um, so the communication um, strategy 
contains things such as that, and that then informs your communication plan. We have all kinds of ways to communicate things to people. We have e-news. We have town halls. We have focus groups. We have one-on-one -on -one meetings. We have all kinds of messages, ways of messaging. And with technology, we're going to get more and more. We're getting a new um, phone system soon that will allow better phone conferencing. We have all different methods. What are the methods that are going to create the most impact in terms of your messaging? That's what you want. You want to bring out the impact so that people understand what change is happening and most importantly, how it's going to impact them. Because ultimately, it is about how do I get through my work day in the most efficient way possible so that I can do the work that I need to do for my departments, for my faculty, for my students, for my uh, research scientists, whoever the audience may be. We need to make sure that we're being able to deliver those systems that are going to successfully be able to communicate um, those messages and help inform the way that we will normalize that as the status quo after project implementation is over. Because it doesn't end necessarily when the project ends. Your involvement may end when the project ends, but it becomes part and parcel of people's daily work lives. So how do we make sure that we're putting those pieces into place so that we can continue with the commitment? Um, in addition to that, and I'm going to close this, hopefully not close the whole thing, um, I am now going to go back to the training strategy. I'll talk through the training strategy. The training strategy is also really important because there are also a number of ways that you can train individuals. We have relied a lot at the university on instructor-led training, and um, by and large, our community seems to be very comfortable with that. I think it gives them the sense that they are coming into an actual area to learn about something where they're concentrating their effort just on that, that task or those series of tasks so they know how to do things, and they feel like they've been given some opportunity to see the system, touch the system, be able to work with it. Um, so that is a method that we often use. Um, in, our, in the Student Information System Project, we used um, different methods because we wanted a system that was so easy that students didn't need any training on it. So we had to develop a robust website. We had to develop little video simulations that were less than five minutes in length each so that students could immediately find um, their way. Uh, we also had to develop something similar for faculty because we were told straightforwardly faculty will not come to training. And a faculty member, in fact, informed me as the training lead for the project at the beginning of, the, at the beginning of my tenure, if I need training on this, you guys have done it wrong. So how do you then give those pieces so that the faculty can successfully approve a student ask for permission to be in their class, that a faculty member can sign off on their cart of courses, that a faculty member can successfully grade their students at the end of the term. So these are all things that we had to think about and was part of the change strategy. So um, finally, and I'm going to scroll down because I can't seem to get the other piece back. I'm trying to get back to that slide. Thank you, Joya. Yeah, next one. Yeah. So, the questions that you want to ask, and we're trying to get to the slide for the questions you want to ask. Nope. Okay, I'll just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> The questions that you want to ask is, have you identified your key stakeholders? What pain points have you identified? What opportunities have you identified? 
similar to your SWOT analysis that you would do for your project generally, incorporate the people side into that analysis. Have you created a communication strategy and plan? Do you have a calendar for your announcements? Do you know what you're going to do if we have a project delay and who are going to be the signatories? And do you have a strategy for the questions you may receive and how that will be follow up? That feedback is also extremely important and it has to continually funnel back. And that can come from um, people talking to your trainers, that can come from people talking to your business analysts, that can come from people talking to all of your various stakeholders. So how do we make sure that there's a feedback mechanism? How do you make sure that that's getting incorporated back and that becomes, again, part of that living document? And then finally, how do you create the training plan? What kind of training are you going to do? Um, how will users know how to register, where the rooms are going to be, all of that good logistical stuff, and how will training materials be distributed? So um, I'm going to pass it back to Joya for the final bit. Thank you, Patty. Okay. Well, I wanted to first of all thank the panel for shedding light on all the different aspects of managing change. There's a lot of information to share, um, but we felt those pieces were important, and then we're going to have time in the next uh, you know, few months to come together if you'd like. You know, you can send us your, your questions so that we can keep incorporating um, and making progress with this evolving change management discussion, right? So just uh, any questions based on what you've heard so far or any topics we didn't touch on that you're interested in us covering in the future? Well, I could ask a question about um, the stakeholder analysis because I think one of the challenges is not necessarily like having a template to put in, but mm -hmm. how do you go about actually approaching the stakeholders and getting information that will help you assess their level of commitment from the starting point? Repeat so, the question for the people in the back. Okay. Yes. So the question is, how do you start that stakeholder analysis, never mind just having um, a place where you can enter in the information, but how do you actually start that conversation? How do you actually start um, to assess your stakeholders? One of the um, nice things, of course, is that when we make a decision that we're going to move forward with a project, with a new system, is that we've already had conversations about, you know, we need a new budgeting system. Uh, when I was working in the, in the financial applications, um, I actually arrived right at the time of the financial crisis hit. I'm not taking responsibility for that. <laughs> and that, as, as a result, um, we had a new university budgeting system implemented. We had um, the Harvard Crimson Online Marketplace, the HCOM system implemented. We had a whole series of new initiatives. But that we all had conversations about those different projects and who those different stakeholders were. And from the initial business owner conversations, getting their assessment about where things were, we could then filter down all the way to the end user level. So we could find out who it is that we would need to contact. Now, one of the things that Tiffany talked about was the fact that you, know, you want to find your, your champions. And a lot of times, with campus readiness and change management initiatives. It's not a matter of just the formal, you know, this, just the registrar, but who are the influential people in the departments? And one of the things that, that I've been able to learn um, over my period of time here is that there's usually some end users that other people will actually go to and ask questions. Um, when we were trying to uh, figure out the best way to approach the departments about how to create courses in the new course catalog, um, we knew that there were some folks that had many, many years of experience working on their course catalog, and these were the people that we wanted to talk to because other people would go to them. And they had lots of courses, they had all different types of scenarios where they had full year courses, half year courses, variable credit courses, um, all the types of variances that you could think of. You want to try to talk to as many people as possible to try to find these folks who are really going to be impacted in a significant way 
and you want to work with them, and hopefully they will be able to work with you and become champions. Bring them in as super users, as um, what, what's going to be happening in one of Tiffany's projects, and see if we can then get that goodwill out there. So uh, you start with the main business owners, and you work your way out from there. I have one question though. How do you actually identify who your stakeholders are? For example, with the student system, maybe your biggest stakeholders were students mm -hmm. who aren't really organized around any kind of a hierarchy. Right. Uh, and so how do you how do you include them in the picture? So what we ended up doing in the student information system project was we were able to um, actually appoint student ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And we were able to bring them in. We gave them some some early we showed them how to use the system, and they actually, um, in, the, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, there was one for every house. Um, and they did an awful lot of goodwill. They actually helped faculty members, they helped fellow students, um, and so we were able to actually have the student involvement, and they were also able to give us some very valuable feedback because they saw early iterations of the system. So that was exceptionally helpful. We did the same thing. We did a similar thing with faculty. We asked faculty if they were willing to come on board, and we had a couple of faculty members who were really willing to, to jump in and take a look at the system and gave us some very valuable feedback. We also took advantage of the Hewitt Here to Help sessions where they set up little kiosks throughout the campus uh, to help uh, students with just regular desktop issues. We also had a presence there so that if, if they had a question about the system, we'd be able to respond to that. So in addition to the robust website that I talked about, we also have these other initiatives available as well. Any other questions? Fine. Yeah, I had a question actually regarding the, the project group um, that worked on the MyDot Harbor project. It was a large project group and then now it's going back to kind of operational for the student information system. And I was curious about the key, what made that transition successful? What are the key takeaways that you would recommend going forward? Well, we're actually still in the process of transitioning. Okay. Because we um, implemented the system with four additional schools this fall. Okay. Um, and we did have a knowledge base of consultants um, from one firm that had really worked with the system very robustly and we made sure that we took advantage of their knowledge and also took advantage of tools such as Confluence uh, to help us with knowledge transfer to make sure that our business analysts um, that were the Harvard analysts on the project would be have enough information to be able to carry forward with it. That knowledge transfer is extremely important and I think probably everyone here has had experience with consultants and sometimes um, when a project ends and the consultant leaves you don't have that benefit of the knowledge transfer it's really really important to make sure you bake that in um, so having that transition um, was transitional piece was very important and taking advantage of the tools like Confluence where we basically set up um, you know, different profiles for each of the schools. We talk through all of their various academic business processes and then making sure that we had, working with the consultants, um, enough information that we could do that knowledge transfer. We always had someone from Harvard and a consultant working with the school. We didn't have just a consultant alone. And that was very, very important to make sure that that, that, that comes through. It will be interesting to see with a smaller group operationally, how we move forward, but we are putting those plans into place now, as well as you know, just trying to establish you know your service catalog, all of those kinds of things that come as part of operationalizing. Um, how did you align your, specifically in terms of frequency, your communications cadence with your sprint cadence? Was it what did your communication plan specifically look like? So the plan really focused in on um, when key milestones were going to be hit. So with we did use an agile cadence, 
and there were some deliveries of things such as um, for the departments um, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences that were going to be uh, developing the courses for their departments, um, be making sure that they were aware um, that this, this is when the, the project would be available, this is when the training was going to begin. And basically we started that training in the early part of um, 2014 and then in um, June the, the catalog was actually made live. Um, it was a soft launch, that's when we had the students and the faculty that I just talked about come in and take a look at things. Um, so they had an opportunity to uh, make sure that we were communicating out those messages. Then, of course, we worked with the registrar's offices to try to figure out a schedule of communications, um, and they were able to send out various messages. They announced town halls, and they did a lot of town halls in, in FAS. That's how they got a lot of their messaging out, but they also sent out a lot of key messages targeted to specific groups, such as students, such as faculty, um, such as you know, just freshmen for things like freshman seminars, things of that nature. So um, they were all targeted to specific audiences at various points when as, as things were released and made available. Um, we knew that sending out, sending out a message in June to the faculty makes no sense. They're generally not here. Um, after graduation, they're usually not around. So we had to time those messages near the time that they were actually going to start doing things, end of August, early September. So those are those are those types of examples. Anyone else? Any other questions? Danielle? I just had one and I, for any of you, and it's about cadence in general. Each project manager uh, is owning and loving their project, but the end users and the schools are trying to absorb what can be six or seven major initiatives all at the same time. And when we're trying to get them to buy in and own, um, I just, I guess it's a general question about how we think about that or how we need to think about that. Um, because I think individually, every project has great benefit. I think bandwidth and capacity to absorb is probably one of the biggest challenges we're all starting to face. Do you want to take that to Yeah, we, we've actually talked, we talked about this a lot in FSS um, when we were a group, but this was a big challenge for us because we had a lot of different groups using a lot of the same stakeholders for different projects. Um, and I think that's going to be true of the case with Harvard because we're a decentralized environment and that's usually how we go out and target um, our users. But I think it's really about as much as we can all come to an understanding in terms of what we're doing and how that impacts the users and having an understanding for this group is doing this and I have this project that's also doing these key things that's touching um, the same audience, that will be able to, that will help us to make more um, informed decisions. That will help us to say, hey, maybe we can't go live in May with this new PeopleSoft upgrade because Oracle is putting something into place in April and uh, that that will negatively affect the Harvard Business School. So the more that we as um, as a group, whether it's Hewitt or Cadham or um, whoever we are that's going out to the schools and impacting them, um, impacting their users, the more we understand the lay of the land and what's going on and how we're um, impacting the different groups, the better off that we are and we can um, manage the change as it hits those groups. I think change saturation is very important. That's a very key problem that we have here. People can only absorb so much and we're all touching them in different ways and we see that every day. We're working through it with the MFR project um, and just internal to the project there are a lot of things coming at people from all of the different work streams. So again it's about staying aligned. It's about us staying aligned uh, across the groups. And, and I think it's, I mean, I should say, I'm thrilled that the technical groups have come together for consistency, and uh, I think it's great, and more of an awareness of impacts across and how we engage stakeholders, because it's been, you know, somewhat different and uneven for all the right or wrong reasons, so I think to the degree for project managers, that toolkit and helping mm -hmm. think about um, 
different schools have different stakeholders, different size populations. One system may touch a thousand people or it may touch ten people. And those sometimes we've just had a really uneven um, distribution across those. That's so one of the things we talked about when we were coming up with this panel. One of the things that is very evident is that some groups, some schools or groups have change management resources, whereas other schools don't, and we end up serving that purpose. And so the more that we as a group in here understand those nuances about the schools and about the groups, the better effective that we can be if we just picking up and, and going into them. You may have just identified a good topic for a future meeting of this community of practice to mm -hmm. say, how are we managing this? Um, how are we managing our relationship with each other and our impact, the collective impact that we're having on our clients? Or, I think going back to sort of that, you know, change requires a lot of horsepower and it's exhausting. So people feel a lot of exhaustion from all the changes and multiple projects coming their way. We all need to do a better job of staying coordinated and managing that impact on our on the recipients of the change. One of the things that I think I touched briefly on early is um, the organizational impact exercises we're doing with our ITCRB uh, projects this year. And I don't know, Ellen, if you have something to add to what it is that we're trying to do in terms of a new initiative that might help us. Um, sure. So part of the goal behind the organizational impact exercise that we're uh, trying this year with ITCRB is more to focus on making a very specific opportunity for each of the projects to have a conversation with a representative of each of the schools. And for those schools to feel that they are in an environment where they can influence that project, they can influence it both budget, schedule, priorities, all those types of things through that discussion. And it is basically to open that dialogue so that we make sure that the communities that are going to be most impacted by a particular project are not only aware this project is happening, they are aware of what other projects might be occurring at the same time, and they have that opportunity to affect what the functional area might be planning and to make it more um, sensible for each of the schools. So that could be anything from we can't possibly do this, we need help, we need backfill, to we can't be in wave one, we want to be in wave three of the releases because of this other thing. So it's, it's to really start those conversations. We're trying to organize this around mostly groups that already exist that are across university, across school or groups, uh, bringing them together and putting the project managers in front of them to talk about their projects and have these discussions. So this will be the first year of trying to do this. Um, and we're hoping, based on what we learn out of this, that then we can formalize it into, a be into an even better process for next year and use it and leverage it as a way to have more strategic conversations with the schools around the IT, which I think in the long run is really the key to managing what you call change saturation, is having those, those conversations at a more strategic level so that it makes sense to them why these different activities are happening and how they align to what they really want to happen in their school, in their particular functional area. Any okay. other questions? Thank you, Ellen. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So, um, basically, we wanted, in closing, to, to remind you, and I guess this, that's what it is. <clears throat> I can't this work. Yeah, I'm having technical difficulties here. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted to mention that um, you know we have two uh, part two and three coming up. Part two will be in February, and we will focus on how you work with stakeholders. Um, schools. Did you get it? Okay, thank you. And then part three is in April, as we mentioned, which is to build the change management toolkit. So this is that task force that Ellen's on it, and I think uh, there are other folks from QIT that will be working. Um, and so we will be funneling sort of any questions and areas that you, know, you have, so you're welcome to send them to us, send them to me, and then we'll, and Ellen, and then We'll try to incorporate all of that in this new strategy that we come up with so that we'll be consistent and thoughtful about our approach to change management. Okay? Okay. So as you make, 
we're pretty much done unless you have any other questions. And so as you make your way out, we wanted to get your feedback on how the session went, things that we did well, you'd like us to continue, what didn't work for you in this session, and things that you didn't uh, see us do that you'd like us to incorporate. We've been having these monthly sessions on various topics. This one is such a rich topic that it deserves more than one session, so it's, that's why it's a three-part series. We hope that you can come back. Um, and then in closing, I wanted to say that, um, you know, if we do it well, like in the case of an iPhone, you know, it's, it changes your life completely. People stand in line because they can't live without it. You do everything on it. If you, you, know, you need it to drive to work. You need it to set your alarm in the morning. Um, so, you know, thinking about how you get people to really want something by compelling them and helping them see the value it'll bring to their lives and how much easier we'll get for them once they adopt this tool. I think that's kind of the challenge and it's creating that sense of urgency and bringing people to the positive side. Um, and then I wanted to leave on this um, funny note here, Joy, which is... Joy, yes. just one thing. Um, I do have post-it notes for this, but because you have these cards and you didn't get questions from the audience, feel free to use your note card that you already have on your person and write start, stop, or continue, and this basket will be available for you to drop a card in here too, okay? Thank you. Does anyone need a